Water puzzle for city. Where can fountain go next? An article from the Echo of Thursday the 24th of January by Alistair Horton. A famous city fountain could be moving after a developer revealed plans to build a hotel where it stands. Elliott Group said it has bought Beetham Plaza, which sits just off the Strand in Liverpool and is home to the Silk Road and Etsu restaurants. The square at the centre of the scheme houses the Piazza Fountain, often called the Bucket Fountain. It's made up of a series of buckets on poles that fill up with water before spinning round and dumping the water loudly into the pool below. But Elliot says it wants to build a new £10 million hotel on that part of the square, meaning the fountain and its two viewing platforms would need to go. The group's owner, Elliot Lawless, says he's open to ideas about where the fountain could move to, and he says the company would meet the relocation costs. He said it's a great piece of engineering, but it's hidden in this part of the business district and deserves a more visible location so that more people can enjoy it. Just as our beloved Super Lamb Banana had to find a new home, so it's time for the buckets to go on a short journey. The question is, to where? We're talking to the council about their own aspirations for the fountain, but would very much welcome the public's view. The fountain was designed by Welsh sculptor Richard Hughes. When it was installed, he said, it is a waterfall of a strange new kind. Instead of streaming steadily, water hurtles down unexpectedly in detached lumps in all directions. Elliot did not reveal how much it paid for Beetham Plaza. The new hotel would be operated by Epic, That company operates the Seal Street Hotel, which is part of Elliot's ongoing £100 million development around Wolston Home Square. Mr Lawler said, Beetham Plaza remains one of the most successful residential developments on Liverpool's waterfront, but the public square behind needs more animation and life to support its commercial tenants. If we recite the fountain, it'll enable us to develop a new hotel a new ground floor restaurant and cafe space while investing in the public realm and a new lighting scheme. Residents and businesses will share in the benefits of this investment and the extra footfall. Among its other projects, Elliott Group is drawing up plans for housing on the site of Liverpool's disused Caribbean Centre in Toxteth. From Friday, January the 25th. Charity reveals 30,000 women miss smear test. More than 30,000 young women in Merseyside have missed their smear test. A third of women aged between 25 and 29 and 3 in 10 women aged 30 to 34 have not had a screen in the past three and a half years, according to NHS digital figures. The low take-up of screening for this age group 25 to 29 are the least likely to attend means there are 33,539 women under 35 across Merseyside without an an up-to-date test. The figures come during Cervical Cancer Prevention Week. Research by Joe's Cervical Cancer Trust launched to coincide with the week found the majority of young women who delay or don't go for smear tests said they felt embarrassed, scared or vulnerable at the prospect. All eligible women who are registered with the, G- registered with the GP automatically receive an invitation by mail. Women aged 25 to 49 receive invitations every three years. Women aged 50 to 64 receive invitations every five years. Screening rates are better for older age groups, peaking at 74% for those aged 50 to 54. However, overall, 113,998 women aged between 25 and 64 in Merseyside are not up to date with their screening. Chief Executive of Joe's Cervical Cancer Trust, Robert Music, said, Smear tests provide the best protection against cervical cancer, and yes, we know they're not always easy. We want women to feel comfortable talking to the nurse and asking questions. It's not making a fuss and there are many ways to make the test easier. Please don't let your fears stop you booking a test. From the Echo on Saturday the 26th of January headed No Deal March Brexit could hit Irish runners at this year's national by Nick Tyrrell, local democracy reporter. 
The Grand National could end up looking very different if the UK leaves the EU this spring with no deal. The four-day festival starts on April 4th, less than a week after Britain's planned departure from the EU. But the rejection of Theresa May's Brexit deal and the threat of the UK leaving without a deal could have serious consequences for the number of horses that are able to race. Irish horses, which make up a significant proportion of the total number, travel in and out of the UK thanks to agreements based on EU law. In total, 15 of the 40 horses at last year's event were held by Irish, Irish trainers. Last year's winner, Tiger Roll, is trained in Ireland and is tipped for a successful return this year, but a no-deal Brexit could complicate the situation for Irish horses. That's because the UK would be classified as a third country by the EU, something which could then mean stronger controls on the movement of live animals across borders. The British Horse Racing Authority, or BHA, is planning for a number of Brexit scenarios and is focused on making this year's event a success. A BHA spokesman said, We are watching the political discussions around Brexit very closely and talk frequently to government. We are planning for a range of outcomes and a successful running of the event in April. Leaving without a deal wouldn't necessarily mean that Irish horses immediately faced huge hurdles getting in and out of the UK, but it would require Britain and other countries to come to their own arrangements to make sure they can do so. An agreement between the UK, France and Ireland on the movement of horses could cease to apply in the case of no deal. The government is aiming to get Britain designated as a listed country, which would significantly reduce the requirements on trainers taking horses between the UK and the EU. Horse racing is one of many industries trying to prepare for Brexit. Merseyside councils have warned against the danger of a no-deal Brexit, with some, like Liverpool and Knowsley, calling for a second referendum to be held on leaving Wednesday, the Wednesday 30th of January's Echo, Liam Thorpe had a report on surgeries possibly closing. Thousands of patients could be affected after it was revealed six Liverpool GP surgeries could close in five months. NHS Liverpool Clinical Commissioning Group, CCG, is writing to patients at the six city surgeries to let them know that the organisation that runs them has given notice on its fixed-term contracts. Primary Care Connect, a not-for-profit company set up by Liverpool GPs, will stop managing the practices by the end of June. The GP practices affected are Primary Care Connect Everton Road, Primary Care Connect Anfield Health, Primary Care Connect Garston, Primary Care Connect Netherley Health Centre, Primary Care Connect West Speak, Primary Care Connect Park View. The CCG, which plans NHS healthcare for the city, said it needs to look at whether it will be able to find someone else to run each practice or whether it will need to transfer patients to nearby practices. This might not mean the same result for every affected practice, with the CCG saying each one will be assessed individually. Everton Road, Anfield Health and Garston all share buildings with other GP practices but these are separate to Primary Care Connect. None of these other practices are affected. The CCG is currently writing to all Primary Care Connect patients to explain the steps it is taking and is inviting people to share their views, with letters due to arrive at people's homes next week. Primary Care Connect holds fixed-term contracts until the end of March 2020, but is bringing them to an end early due to problems in recruiting permanent doctors. It is having to rely on temporary doctors, known as locums, which can make it harder to provide quality or consistency of care. Locums are also more expensive than permanent GPs, which has created financial problems. The CCG said this is even more challenging, as Primary Care Connect's practices have relatively small lists of patients and all GP practices are paid based on the number of patients registered with them. Dr Fiona Lemons, a Liverpool GP and chair of NHS Liverpool Clinical Commissioning Group, said, for the time being, Primary Care Connect patients should continue to use their practice in exactly the same way as they do now. 
They don't need to do anything differently or take any immediate action. There is no suggestion of reducing GP services in Liverpool. As soon as a final decision has been made, the CCG will write to patients again. This is likely to be during March. This is from the Echo, Wednesday, January the 30th. Bomb hoax scare for city flyers. Shocked passengers told how a flight headed for Liverpool was grounded after a reported hoax bomb threat. Dramatic pictures show the moment sniffer dogs, police, the army and the bomb squads descended on the EasyJet plane at Krakow Airport. Alex Young and her boyfriend, Michael Bai from Liverpool, watched as bomb squads and sniffer dogs started searching the plane. Alex24 told the Echo, We saw police and the army turning up. They brought out German Shepherd sniffer dogs and we saw them go into the plane. Then they came back down and started searching the airport staff. They then set about taking the luggage off the plane to search that as well. According to the Liverpool couple, pass, to, uh, sorry, according to the Liverpool couple, Alex included what, were concerned about getting on the flight after witnessing the huge search. My boyfriend was calm, but I wanted to go on a different flight. She added, everyone was worried because they were searching staff on the ground and you could see the mirrors they used to check under the vehicles and the dogs and searching people. People were a little worried to get on the flight. Extra searches were then made of every passenger with the dogs searching each passenger before they could board and then they had an extra document to check with the boarding passes. The couple were later told by the pilot that a prankster had called Krakow Airport telling them a bomb was on the flight headed towards the UK. And it's thought that another EasyJet flight destined for Belfast was also searched as part of the extra security measures. Alex and Michael, who were headed home after a four-day city break in Krakow, believe the airport may have, been, have known about the threat before the flight as they'd noticed extra security earlier in the day. They said, we went through the security and they seemed to be doing a bit extra. Cases were being swabbed. I didn't think anything of it. We sat in a queue going down the stairs for about 15 minutes and they brought us back and said we couldn't get on the plane. They said it was suspended, which made us wary. EasyJet confirmed extra security measures were put in place before the flight and the flight departed one hour 45 minutes late. New speed on green cameras set to snare law-breaking drivers. An article from the Echo on the 25th of January by Luke Trainer, chief reporter. <clears throat> a new type of camera which records a driver's speed at traffic lights is next week being trialled on the streets of Merseyside. The temporary scheme is part of Merseyside Police's strategy to reduce the number and severity of injury collisions and to reduce the overall speed of vehicles on the region's roads. As Speed Awareness Month starts, the Merseyside Road Safety Partnership, or MRSP, will be introducing a number of speed-on green cameras at some of the county's junctions. They will not only detect when a driver has jumped a red light, signal but will also record the speed of those vehicles travelling above the speed limit through the junction regardless of the colour of the traffic light signal. In 2017 there were 557 people killed or seriously injured on the roads of Merseyside and many more were involved in collisions which proved life-changing for them and their families. There are many reasons why crashes occur but a common contributory factor is speed whether it be inappropriate or excessive speed. The statistics also show that most collisions occur on 30 mile an hour roads with junction areas of particular danger. A number of suitable junctions have been earmarked for the speed on green cameras with Sefton being the first area to receive them. Each will be clearly signposted as a speed camera for the locations across Merseyside. <coughs> Jane Eaton from the Safer Roads Unit of the Partnership said these cameras have the potential to improve safety on our roads by influ influencing the speed of drivers at junctions and reducing the risk of a crash. However, we would prefer if the cameras were redundant and drivers drove responsibly and within speed limits. By their very nature, junctions present an increased risk to drivers. A green traffic light signal can often create an unpredictable situation for a driver to deal with and it is vitally important that drivers drive at an appropriate speed. 
Merseyside Police Commissioner Jane Kennedy said, Far too many people lose their lives or suffer serious injury on our roads. We know that speed is a major factor in many of the, those collisions. I hope that by implementing speed on green cameras, more drivers will pay closer attention to their speed, make sure they are sticking to the limits and driving This was a man called James Harper, who's won an Echo Award and says it is helping his business grow. James's company, Walton Flooring Centre, was a winner at the Regional Business Awards last year. This year's awards are now open, and our judges are again looking for entries from the region's best businesses. The winners will be honoured at a ceremony at Liverpool's Anglican Cathedral in June. The event is organised by The Echo and our sister magazine, The Business Post. The executive sponsor is Liverpool Business School at Liverpool John Moores University. Walton Flooring started in 2011 and has grown into one of the largest family-owned flooring companies in the Northwest, with five stores and with plans to expand. It won the award for Business of the Year with up to 50 employees at last year's Regional Business Awards. Director James said winning at the Echo Awards was our biggest achievement as a growing business. I used to be a paperboy delivering the Echo, and now here we are winning an Echo Award. The awards ceremony was exceptional and winning the award has helped us secure large commercial contracts as I believe this has installed more confidence in our company. Business of the year, three different categories to enter. Depending on the size of your business, you could enter one of three different categories. One, business of the year up to 50 employees. Two, business of the year 51 to 250 employees, sponsored by MSIF and Business of the Year over 250 employees, sponsored by Merseyrail. In all three categories, our judges are looking for companies that can demonstrate they have delivered consistent growth and solid financial performance through great leadership, understanding customers, and keeping employees engaged. The categories are open to all sectors. We also want to honour the city region's successful startups. So we're also welcoming entries for our new Business of the Year category. It's open to businesses that began trading after January the 1st, 2017. If you are a high-performing new company with something to shout about, then this is the award for you. The judges will be looking for evidence of a sustainable business that has met, or is on its way to meeting, initial targets and that can demonstrate success in their industry with the potential to grow strongly He's in the future. The on Thursday, January the 24th. Firm shows how sectors unite for success. The company that brought new life to the old ICA, ICI site in Runcorn says its latest massive London property deal is a regeneration example for the rest of the UK ahead of Brexit. SOG took over the old ICI offices in Runcorn and turned it into the Heath Business and Technical Park. It's home to dozens of firms and today more people work at the site than did when ICI was at its zenith. SOG then took its model to London when it took over part of the former Sanofi pharmaceutical plant in Dagenham and turned it into the L London East UK Business and Technical Park. Now, SOG has sold London East UK to a company owned by Barking and Dagenham Council. The council has ambitious plans for the site, including a film studio and data centre. SOG Group Managing Director John Lewis said the company's Dagenham success showed how the public and private sectors could work together on high-profile schemes. He said, with all the fallout over Brexit and major job cuts being announced in the car and nuclear power industries, it's important to acknowledge how we are reversing that trend, and we've done so without any government subsidies. This deal is a great example of the public and private sectors sharing a vision with the determination to deliver a monumental development with no public funding for subsidies. And he added, we were originally appointed by Sanofi to spearhead the regeneration of the entire site to ensure a, a legacy of new business opportunities at this location. I like to feel SOG got the site out of intensive care, onto the ward and then out of hospital. 
we've created a superb science and business park and helped to ensure the rest of the site has been sold in strategic process that will create Thank thousands of new jobs. Rising bill for Royal. Hospital costs underestimated after collapse of building company by Liam Thorpe, Echo reporter, from Wednesday the 30th of January. The costs of completing the stalled Royal Liverpool Hospital have been underestimated, according to the Trust, who will need to borrow more cash to complete the project. Papers released for a meeting on Wednesday the 30th of January of the Royal and Liverpool Broad Green University Hospitals Trust state the costs for completing the hospital following the termination of the PFI contract with Carillion have been underestimated. That contract was torn up last year following months of no work taking place at the site after the collapse of Carillion in January 2018. The notes in the papers say the effect of that underestimate is that the Trust will need to secure additional loans to fund completion of the works. The original hospital project was projected to cost £335 million before Carillion collapsed. In September, it was revealed the heavily criticised contractor had fitted the hospital with the wrong exterior cladding, bringing with it extra costs. Since then, the Trust has appointed Lango Rourke as its new contractor and work has started again on the site with the hope that it will be open in 2020. A Trust spokesperson said, since taking over the project in October 2018, we now have full access to commercial information previously held by the hospital company. We have also been working closely with Lango Rourke and external advisors who are undertaking a thorough assessment of all the works needed to complete the new Royal. This includes significant works required to fix the structural issues that were identified. Our staff are working with the design team on solutions to ensure not only do they fix the issues, but also that they don't adversely impact on clinical space, which can have a bearing on the costs. He added, following these assessments, the overall costs for completion have been re-estimated and they are higher than previously anticipated. Once these costs are completed, we will submit our business case to the Department of Health and Social Care for them to approve the funding.